Hey guys, Miss Lerner here. Um, I'm here to just give you some feedback on the Unit 7 um, review activities. Generally speaking, Unit 7 is a unit that people really struggle with. So it's important for you to kind of go back and think and reflect about the things that were most problematic for you in the unit. You should probably have some eDoctrina sheets and things of that nature that really hone in on textbook pages and concepts that you need to return to. All right, so let's start out with this chart. Okay, it's called, do you remember? So essentially the information processing model or the three box model of memory was proposed by um, Atkinson and Schifrin. And um, it says that there are three kinds of stages of memory, sensory memory, working memory, long-term memory. And then in order to access information back, you pull it, you retrieve it from long-term memory and, and access it in working memory for a brief window of time. Okay, so the first stage, therefore, would be sensory memory. And this is going to be anywhere between, um, you know, a quarter of a second in terms of um, the iconic memory or visual memory to three to four seconds for um, auditory or e echoic memory. Selective attention was going to revolve around our, in a, our tendency to focus on one element Oops. of a scene and miss large changes. So um, when I showed you that video of the basketball players and they said, but did you see the moonwalking bear? That was an example of how selective attention failed you. As a result of selective attention, we have what is called inattentional blindness. That is one type of um, perceptual blindness we have. The other type of blindness is change blindness, which you know is going to relate back to selective attention because we, if we are honing in on one specific detail or one specific task, we may miss all of the changes like in the whodunit video that I had shown you in class as well. Right. So the capacity was discovered by Sperling's nine letter experiment with the accompanying tone. He had that grid of various letters. We thought that, you know, it was very small at first, like, you know, all but three or four kind of disappear from your consciousness. But in reality, when they paired the tone with the line, we saw that you were able to remember 12 to 16 items. Okay, so it was larger than we originally anticipated. There's going to be every type of sensation is going to have an associated um, area in sensory memory. Iconic memory is visual memory. Echoic memory is auditory memory. And then we would have things like um, gustatory memory, which is for taste, olfactory memory for smell, tactile memory for touch. When someone says your name across the room and you shift your attention there, that's that's a real psychological term. It sounds made up, but it's called the, the cocktail party effect or the cocktail party phenomenon. And this is especially unfortunate if you have a name, a common name or a name that rhymes with something else that is constantly diverting your attention over there. All right, so short-term memory, frequently called working memory because it works very, very hard to overcome its limited capacity and duration, okay? In terms of how long it lasts, the brief window is gonna be 20 to 30 seconds. And arguably the most important element of trying to be a better student is trying to use your working memory to your advantage. And in order to do that, you have to use the magic number. Miller, George Miller's magic number is going to be seven plus, is the plus on here plus or minus two items 
So on the on the low end, you're going to remember five things in your working memory. On the high end, you're going to remember nine things. And this is why I say that you should chunk together material in your consciousness because that way you're going to be able to pull out clusters or chunks of related material. So if I chunk together all of the information about short-term memory, it's going to be much easier as long as I don't go above, let's say, that magic number of seven. All right, central executive. The central executive is going to be um, kind of like the CEO of the working memory. Almost like, kind of like the thalamus. Like it directs the traffic. It says, you know, it's coming in from the sensory memory um, and then it's going to be directed to the work, um, to the long-term memory and then pulling it back. It's going to tell it what to do. The phonological loop will be for sounds, processing sounds. Think of a phone. The visual spatial sketch pad is for envisioning surroundings. These three kind of theoretical components work together as part of your working memory. Now, how do we improve, um, you know, improve our ability to use working memory to our advantage? We use what are called mnemonic devices or memory aids. And there's different types of these. For instance, there's the peg word method. One is a bun, two is a shoe. If you remember, I had given you that peg word method for um, Erickson stages, like um, trust versus mistrust, one is a bun. So imagine um, a bun with crust, you know, and um, then you'll remember trust versus mistrust, even a rusty crust. Um, two is a shoe. Think of you're driving in a car in an automobile with your friend Shane, autonomy versus shame and doubt. Three is a tree. Think of Shia LaBeouf in a tree, hiding himself with a quilt, Initi initiative versus guilt. Okay, so you remember a series of items in a list, like those those peg words with, the, you know, th this kind of rhyme that you are going to constantly pair up with things that you are drawing associations there. The more associations and personal associations you make to material, the more likely you are to remember it. This is called the self-reference effect. Okay, so whenever you get a psych psychology term, please relate it to your life. And I try to do that. I try to do that with like attendance and things like that. But um, it's up to you really to take the, the next step. Okay. A method of loci is um, this kind of mem memorization technique known as a memory palace where I take items on a list or in an order and I pair it up with um, a, a mental walk through an area that I'm very familiar with. Um, this is how the ancient Greek orators could remember long epic poems. Um, it is going to be a very, very effective method because remember the, hypoca the hippocampus is going to be responsible for both um, spatial relationships and memory. So if you can pair those together, um, you're going to, you're going to be set. You're going to be set. Okay. And then there's two ways that we can rehearse information um, in order to make it more likely to be stored. Maintenance rehearsal, which is essentially repeating. Oops, repeating. I need to learn how to type. Info over and over. Milk, eggs, cheese, bread. Milk, eggs, cheese, bread. Toilet paper. <laughs> um, it's cramming. And while it will work for a brief window of time, it's not. It's not going to um, be be effective in the long term. For that reason, we, we like to use elaborative rehearsal or elaboration. This is going to be um, connecting new information to previous relearned info. Okay, so again, this does kind of go back to the self-reference effect because really, um, you know, who do you know best than you? That's previously learned info. Right. And sometimes we talk about the elaborative rehearsal being a an example of levels of processing theory. Levels of processing theory, um, just meaning the more kind of connections that you can make with something, um, the more likely you are to remember it. All right. And then last but not least, long-term memory. 
the duration is um, infinite in term, in, until dementia or something takes place or death. Um, the capacity is unlimited. But um, unfortunately, as good as that sounds, it is going to be problematic for retrieval. Because remember, we have encoding, storage, and retrieval. And um, errors in memory are going to result from problems in each of those areas. So if I'm not encoding or, or selectively attending properly, I'm never going to remember where I say I put my keys and I have an encoding failure. If I'm, you know, not store, storing things properly, then I'm never going to actually be able to hold on to that information. And then I can have that information in my long-term memory, but my long-term memory can look like an episode of hoarders. So I'm unable to retrieve it. So whenever you are thinking about an actor, you're thinking about a movie, you're thinking about a vocab term, and it's just on the tip of your tongue, you say, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. That's a real psychological phenomenon that is reflecting retrieval failure, known as the tip of the tongue phenomenon. You're totting out. You can't, you, you do have the information, but you cannot retrieve it at this time. All right. So um, I did, come, I had that long-term memory tree when we went over this initially. So let's talk about it. Episodic memory is going to be events in your life. I hope you all kind of went back to memory lane in terms of our class year together so far um, in the attendance yesterday. Semantic memory is facts, and general knowledge, kind of like ooh, general, general, um, kind of like the type of knowledge you you achieve in school or that is measured on a typical IQ test. Um, like that analytical intelligence. Procedural memory is ju just me um, memory for how to do things. And episodic and semantic memory, so you know, together are frequently call are frequently going to be called um, declare examples of declarative memory. that um, these are facts. These, this is something I declare. Um, it's not going to be non-declarative memory, like procedural memory and implicit memory. Procedural memory is a type of implicit memory. It's an unconscious type of memory. So why is my computer being so slow? That does not have to be effort fully rehearsed. So um, when you remember where you, where something is on a textbook page, where you remember um, the color of your neighbor's house, you didn't stand in front of their, their house and say, white, 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 white. It's just from progressing through life, you learn this at a implicit, not unconscious level. Explicit memory is going to be the opposite. It's going to require effort to rehearse and remember. Your understanding of explicit memory as a definition is a type of explicit memory. Eidetic memory is going to be a fancy name for a photographic memory, and it's very, very, very rare. We think it only really happens in children. People age out of it. Um, it's the ability to reproduce an exact replica of a page. And then a flashbulb memory is a highly emotional memory, but it is still subject to misattribution, sense of misattribution, wrong place, wrong people, wrong time, and suggestibility. We, we have great confidence in our memories, but that has no bearing on whether it's actually true or not. Okay. Retrieval. Retrieval is just getting information out of long-term memory. 
and putting it in short-term memory or working memory for a brief window of time. The serial position effect is the tendency to remember the first and last items burned. So whether it be on a list or whether it be in a course, you tend to remember, let's say, in psychology, um, the history of psychology, and then the last unit that we did, which was psychological disorders. What are we going to forget about the most? The chapter that we're the unit that we're doing right now, the one that comes straight in the middle, according to the serial position effect. There are two pieces of the serial position effect, the primacy effect and the recency effect. Primacy effect is you remember what happened first. The recency effect is you remember what happened last. Okay. Generally speaking, the primacy effect, because we think it is associated with long-term memory, is going to trump the recency effect if we ever have that question. Okay. The encoding specificity principle, this other type of ESP, means that um, the closer the retrieval cues match the environment in which it was learned, better you will do in remembering. So it's kind of screwy now because we're home and we basically learned the whole course while we were in school. But um, in theory, you would want to study the same place um, with, you know, the same kind of environment as when you take the test. If I, you know, spritz myself with some vanilla perfume while I was studying for psychology, when I took a test, I'd want to spritz myself with that same scent. And it would theoretically, according to the encoding specificity principle, activate um, a better memory. Mood congruent memory just means that when you are sad, you remember sad times and the opposite when you're happy. This explains why depression or major depressive disorder is such a um, self, it's such, it's such a vicious cycle that it goes over and over again because you can't really remember things um, that are happy to bring you out of it. And then state dependent memory is the tendency to remember information best if in the state, the same state of consciousness as when it was learned. Um, so if you're, if you have um, this class first period, you're always tired. Um, hopefully, you know, you take the AP exam when you're tired as well. Okay. Um, all right, so then let's move to the multiple choice questions. Okay, a couple of really confusing concepts people mess up all the time. Retroactive and proactive interference, retrograde, um, and anterograde amnesia. Two very different concepts. First of all, retroactive interference versus proactive interference. Proactive interference is when old information moves forward, pro- and gets in the way of new information. I had given you that mnemonic, P-O-R-N, okay? In terms of pro proactive interference is when old restricts new. Retro is the opposite, reno, okay? Retroactive interference is when new gets in the way of old. So here are some um, choices here. Uh, after suffering a blow to the head, gene cannot form new memories. No, that would be called anterograde amnesia. Lila failed the psychology test because she studied for anatomy test after studying psychology. Um, I'm going to keep that one around. Okay. It seems to me that it's saying that the anatomy information that she studied most recently is moving backward retroactively to get in the way of psychology. Lee cannot remember an important date on the history exam. No, that's just retrieval failure. Um, Gene cannot remember his new locker combination, but remembers last year's. That would be an example of proactive interference. Remember, his old combination is getting in the way of new information. Judy remembers the first few items on her school supply list, but cannot remember the rest of them. That would be the primacy effect. So the example here, the answer here rather, is going to be B. Lila failed a psychology test because she studied for her anatomy test after studying psychology. 
Which example will be better explained by the levels of processing model than the information processing model? Okay, so levels of processing, the more connections you make, the more time you spend with something, um, the more likely you are to remember it. Someone says your name across the room and you switch your attention away from the conversation you're having. That's the cocktail party phenomenon. You forget part of a list you were trying to memorize for a test. Uh, that doesn't really say much. While visiting your grandmother, you recall one of your favorite childhood toys. Um, again, that's not really saying anything about the time or effort you've put into something. You're able to remember verbatim a riddle you worked on for a few days before you figured out the answer. And then you pay less attention to the smell of your neighbor's cologne to the professor's lecture in your college class. This is selective attention. This is the answer. You are able to remember verbatim a riddle you worked on a few days before you were to get the answer. Okay. One of the ways that memories are physically stored in the brain is by what process? We went over this so many times. So many times. Deep processing, which increases levels of neurotransmitters, encoding, which stimulates electric activity in the hippocampus, long-term potentiation, which strengthens connections between neurons, selective attention, which increases myelination of memory neurons, or rehearsal, which causes the brain to devote more neurons to what is being rehearsed. Biologically speaking, brains are physically stored in uh, memories are physically stored in the brain due to long-term potentiation. It should re remind you of an action potential. Okay. Making these connections among neurons. According to nativist theory, nativist theory, language is acquired. So nativist theory, there's that root innate or nate, which means born with. So it's going to have to be talking about something that you are born with, some sort of language acquisition device, perhaps, that um, everyone is born with, like Noam Chomsky talked about by parents reinforcing correct language use, but using an inborn ability to learn language at a certain developmental stage, best in the language and culture native to the, the child and the parents. Please be careful. They're, the college board will try to trick you with things like this. Um, native and nativist, this is not the right answer. Only if formal instruction is provided in the child's native language. Again, they're trying to trick you. Best through the phonics instructional method because children retain, to, retain how to pronounce the phonemes. The only one that deals with being born with it is this inborn one. So that is the answer. Recall is a more difficult process than recognition because, yeah, I mean, if I witnessed a crime and was forced to um, draw the per to, to, to have the um, illustrator draw the person um, versus just picking that person out of the lineup, it would be a much more difficult task. Okay, so. Um, recall something like Jeopardy or an FRQ is more difficult than recognition, which is a multiple choice task. Um, recall, um, let's see, memories retrieved by recognition are held in working memory. Recall memories are held in long-term memory. No, memories are all held in long-term memory. Memories retrieved by recognition are more deeply processed. No, that would be recall. The process of recall involves cues to the memory that, that causes interference. That's kind of okay, but we'll leave that around. Memories retrieved by recognition are more recent than memories retrieved by recall. How does that go with anything? Or the process of recognition involves matching a person, event, or object with something already in memory. Yes, you're just doing a memory game. Here you go. Okay, one of the earliest psychologists to study memory and forgetting was Herman Ebbinghaus. He used himself as a subject to test his own recall of a list of nonsense syllables previously learned through rehearsal. From his work, he came up with the concept of a forgetting curve. This suggests, okay, remembering nonsense syllables can be encoded faster than meaningful information. No, we, we saw that that's not what happens. He, he, the, the meaningless, nonsensical um, words were not remembered better. Old information will interfere with new information. New information will interfere with old information. Recall of meaningless information drops very soon after initial learning and, level, and levels off. Recalls of me recall of meaningless information cannot be retrieved more than three hours of encoding. Oh, it was recall of meaningless information drops very soon after initial learning and then levels off. So bear with me. I'm not very good at drawing, and I'm especially not very good at drawing on this, but um, the forgetting curve kind of looked something like this. Okay, this is time. This is the number of 
remembered, which I'll just put this number sign and R. And then it dropped really quickly and then it like leveled off kind of like a plateau. Okay. And Herman Ebbinghaus called this savings. So if I was to like relearn something, I would already, I would already have this there for me. Okay, so um, that's why it's easier to relearn material that you've already learned than just start over entirely again. Okay, um, a lot of people had um, issues with the difference between something like the availability heuristic, the representativeness heuristic, confirmation bias, things of that nature. Um, just a reminder, the availability heuristic is going to mean that you remember information because it is most accessible and present and recent and available in your consciousness. Okay, so, um, you know, you are watching the news all the time. You are going to be subject to the availability heuristic about whatever they're talking about. This is why we think that people are more likely to, I mean, people are more scared of like, let's say flying than, being, than driving in a car, even though car accidents are much more prominent because the media coverage. Um, representativeness heuristic is going to be something like stereotypes. So I meet someone and I automatically assume that they are a musician by the way that they look or the way that they seem when in reality they're not even very, they have no interest in music. They're not, they don't live that kind of lifestyle. Okay. Um, so which of the following is the best example of availability heuristic judging a situation by a rule that is usually, but not always true. Um, that's really just a heuristic making a judgment according to past experiences that are most easily recalled. Let's leave that judging a problem that should be solved by using a formula that guarantees the right answer. That is called an algorithm. An algorithm is, you know, 100% the right answer all the time. It would be great if we had algorithms for things in our life, for everything in our life, but we don't. Um, making a judgment according to what is usually true in your experience, that's representativeness heuristic. Um, and then solving a problem by breaking it down into more easily available parts, that's just breaking a problem down. Okay, so um, the answer here is going to be making a judgment according to past experiences that are most easily recalled, right? Okay, phonemes and morphemes. Phonemes and morphemes refer to elements of telegraphic speech toddlers use. Telegraphic speech are like, um, is like, you know, that kind of without articles, um, not having good grammar. Um, I had given the example of class like, mama drink, life hard. Okay. Um, but in reality, phonemes and morphemes are just elements of language. Um, overarchingly. Phonemes are the smallest units of sound. Morphemes are the smallest units of meaning. So in the word cats, there's k, uh, t, s. There's four phonemes, but there's only two morphemes, cat and s. Okay. Something like a, like an s can be both a phoneme and a morpheme as long as it's because it's meaningful as a plural. All right. After his car accident, Paul cannot make any new memories. In fact, to remember his daily activities, he must write everything down. This is known as anterograde amnesia. After the event, something is wrong with the consolidation process. That's a great word. Consolidation being the you know biological transfer of memories from short-term memory to long-term memory. Um, Clive Weering had anterograde amnesia. Um, the poor man lived the same 30 seconds over and over again. He was the clip we saw where he was, when he saw his wife, Deborah, he said, Oh, Deborah, um, over and over and over again. All right. The ability to transfer information about words, facts, and events, declarative information from short-term memory, to long-term memory depends on activity and what part of the, the brain you see memory, you say hippocampus. Hippo on campus with a compass. Why is this not up? Oh, no. I move this. Oh, that's nice. Move myself a little bit. 
Okay. Um, after studying for a test, Jack realized he remembered exactly where a piece of information appeared on the page of his textbook, even though he did not try to remember the item. This is an example of um, explicit memory, procedural memory, declarative memory, implicit memory, or semantic memory. Answer being implicit memory. He didn't effortfully encode where the information is. Please don't get confused. It is not an example of eidetic or photographic memory. It is implicit. Because it has all the features associated with the concept of a dog, a, a poodle is called, is considered a prototype. Okay, just like when I think of a bird, I think of, oops, I think of a robin. Okay, compared to divergent thinkers, convergent thinkers are more likely to. So divergent thinkers are creative, convergent thinkers are going to come up with one solution. Um, think outside the box in problem solving. No, that would be creativity. Generate many different solutions to problem solving. That's creativity as well. Choose to problem solve using an algorithm rather than a heuristic. That sounds pretty good. Algorithm being, you know, obviously just this one kind of formulaic type of approach. Use representativeness, heur heuristics to problem solve. No, I mean, th that, that's not really a great answer. Never allow functional fixedness to get in the way of problem solving. Functional fixedness is when you can only see one use for an object. So I'm locked out of my car and I have a hair clip that can that I can use to jiggle the key to get into it, but all I could think of is putting my hair up at the time. Um, so yeah, that they would allow functional fixedness to get in the way of, of problem solving, convergent thinkers would. So um, the answer here is choose to problem solve using an algorithm rather than a heuristic. Okay, um, which of the following sentences best explains the idea of overregularization? Overregularization is a predictable uh, stage of language development. Sometimes it's also known as overgeneralization, where you apply a rule um, too widely when you're learning the rules of grammar. Oh, you have a visit from Cookie Monster. Okay. Um, so when you're first learning a language, you don't really understand what is going to be regular and irregular. So you just apply it to everything. So something like yesterday, I go to the store instead of yesterday, I went to the store would be overregularization. Um, Eliana frequently says, yes, I are. Can you say that? Yes, I are. Wow. Death stare. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put my socks on my feet. That's over-regularization as well. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, which of the following statements best illustrates the concept of framing? Framing being like an anchoring bias where you're usually going to look at a value or something that is going to skew your... Pecans on the bag. The way you're going to skew your perception of something based on an initial figure like oh i heard there were a thousand people at the talent show and then you go and you overestimate that that amount okay so similarly it would be something like you know 95 percent fat free versus five percent fat you know you're you're or you're getting gas, everything is like $1.99. You're having a sale, every, uh, you know, everything is on sale in a store. You, you anchor or you frame your opinion of that item on the original price, not the sale price. Um, a PSA for breast mammograms chooses to use a statement, you die if you don't, rather than this can save your life. Let's leave that around. Lily assumes your, her doctor Chris is male when she is female. That's representativeness bias um, or heuristic. An advertiser uses divergent thinking to come up with a commercial slogan. That's just divergent thinking. A person remembers items on a list depending on what order they appear in. That's the serial position effect. A cigarette company puts beautiful women in its commercials. That's what's known as the peripheral route to persuasion. We didn't get to it because um, we didn't get to unit 14. So the answer is a PSA for breast mammograms. It chooses to use the same that you die if you don't rather than this can save your life. Okay, It's, it's a much more dire kind of situation. Um, there's evidence to suggest that there's an inborn tendency to absorb, absorb language. Which of the following psychologists would agree with this statement? Chomsky, Worf, um, Skinner, Saffron, or Sapir? It would be Noam Chomsky. He came up with the language acquisition device. He was a nativist in terms of language. Worf and Sapir came up with the linguistic um, relativity hypothesis or linguistic determinism, saying that the language that the, you speak is going to influence the way in which you perceive the world. Um, so 
that example I gave in class is if you you if you draw if if I ask you to draw the girl pushes the boy, um, you're gonna because we read from left to right, you're gonna draw the girl on the left side. If you if you were in a language that read from right to left, you would draw in the opposite way. Um, the Cook Thoyer people in the IQ chapter, they only have words for one, two, and many. Okay, one, two, and mong. So it's been positive according posited according to the language linguistic um the linguistic relativity hypothesis that um essentially they see number in a different way than we do. Um while walking home from a party drunk, Jeff witnessed a crime. When questioned by the police the following day, he could not remember what he saw. After drinking some liquor, Jeff remembered the crime. This phenomenon best illustrates the framing effect, short-term memory loss, hypnotic amnesia, state-dependent memory, or interrogate amnesia. This is going to be state-dependent memory. If I am drunk when I witness a crime and I'm in that state of consciousness, I am most likely going to remember it better if I'm drunk when I am back at the police station. The ability to maintain exact visual detailed visual memories over a significant period of time is called a lot of people put flashbulb memory that's not flashbulb memory is subject to a lot of errors misattribution suggestibility bias um it's it's a highly emotional event but it it can be colored just like anything else so detailed exact visual memories are going to be eidetic memories okay or um photogra photographic memories which is very rare and lastly, the amygdala is responsible for which type of memories, emotional, procedural, factual, iconic, or visual? Well, iconic and visual will cancel each other out because they're the same. Um, procedural memories are really going to be um, based in, we think, um, the cerebellum and other areas. Um, the amygdala, emotion, aggression, fear should automatically associate that with the amygdala. My friend Amy, very aggressive, scared of her. All right, so um, lots of information in this unit, a very hefty unit. Um, please go back to the biases and heuristics sheet if you don't understand the difference among them. There was also an activity we did in class where we identified some of uh, examples of the biases and heuristics um, and how that could propagate some um, incorrect thought processes. So... Um, thanks for listening. If you got this far, I really, really appreciate it. And it's extremely um, embarrassing for me to uh, to see myself on camera and to see how many times I actually say um in a given um, period of time. Um, so it's something I'm going to be working on, just like we're all, all working on ourselves at this point in time. I miss you. Can't wait to see you. And um, hang in there. Bye-bye.